want to be skipping around a little bit uh, in this, so if it's a little bit jumpy, I, I apologize. But just to our limited time together, I want to be able to get a few points through uh, on this chapter, okay? <clears throat> through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, O Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us. Amen. There is so much demonic influence in the world today. The devil is roaming free because he has given, he has been given the right to do so, and they are vulnerable to uh, horrific attacks by him. Once someone rightly said, in the old days, the devil was preoccupied with human beings, not anymore. He shows people the way, tells them farewell, and off they go. It's terrible. You see, when the demons wanted to enter the swine in the country of the Gadarenes, they asked for Christ's permission. Since the swine had not been given the devil an excuse, he did not have the right to possess them. Christ allowed this to happen so that the Israelites, who were forbidden from eating pork, may be punished. Yeronda, some people say that the devil does not exist. He answers, I know someone told me I should take out the French translation of St. Arsenios of the Cappadocian. All references to demonic possession, because Europeans will not understand it. They don't believe in the existence of the devil, you see. They explain everything with psychology. But if you look at the psychiatrists, the possessed of the gospel, there would be no end to the electro electroshocks. Christ has removed from the devil the right to do harm. The devil can harm us only if we allow him to have power over us. Thus, we do not participate in the mysteries of the church and give rights to tem uh, those who do not participate in the mysteries of the church give rights to temptation and become vulnerable to demonic influence. Yeron, then, what other ways uh, can we give rights to the devil? Rationalism, contradiction, stubbornness, willfulness, disobedience. And insolence are all qualities of the devil. People are vulnerable to the degree that they have these qualities. But when the soul is purified, the Holy Spirit enters a man and fills him with grace. On the contrary, when it is infected with mortal sin, the unclean spirit dwells in him. When again the soul is mortally infected, then it merely under the influence of the evil spirit. It is unfortunate that nowadays people don't want to curb their passions or their will. They do not accept anyone's advice. From this point on, they speak with insolence and reject the grace of God. As a result, anything they undertake does not prosper because it is subject to satanic influences. Man is beside himself because the devil detracts, uh, directs him from the outside. The devil is not inside the man. God forbid. But even from the outside, he can take over uh, and run a, a, a person's life. When divine grace departs from a man, he becomes worse than the devil. For there are things that the cunning devil himself will not do. Instead, he urges men to do them for him. He does not, for instance, commit crimes. He has men do them for him. That is how people end up being possessed. <clears throat> if people only went to their spiritual father to confess their sins, the demonic influence would cease. And they would, not be, they would be able to think more clearly. Nowadays, they, uh, they cannot even think because of demonic influence. Repentance and confession deprive the devil of its rights over us. When the devil has been allowed to acquire great rights over man and has him in a grip, the cause that will bring his power to an end must be found. Otherwise, no matter how intensely the others pray for someone, the devil will not leave him. The devil will cripple a man. Priests may do exorcisms over and over again, but the possessed man ends up paying the price since the devil will then torture him even more because of exorcisms. Unless we repent and go to confession and destroy the, uh, the rights of the devil he has over us, he will not go away and we will always be troubled. As long as the devil has these rights, he will not go away even if one reads and re our reads and rereads exorcisms for days, weeks, months, and years. Yeronda, someone asks, why am I overwhelmed by the passions? If one gives in to temptations, he is seized by passions. What God wants from you, which is for your benefit too, is to take your passions and throw them at the devil's face. Turn your anger, your stubbornness, and so on against him. Or what is even better, 
sell your possessions to the devil and use the money to buy stones to throw at him and keep him at a distance. Most often we human beings allow the enemy to harm us by giving him all kinds of excuses, either through carelessness or through proud thoughts. The devil can even take advantage of the simplest thought or word. I remember once there was a family who had a great love for each other. One day the husband started saying to his wife, I will divorce you. And the wife was telling him the same thing. I will divorce you. They were only kidding, of course. But the tempter, the devil, took advantage of it and set up some minor difficulty which brought them on the verge of a real split. They did not even think of their children or anything else. Fortunately, a spiritual father talked to them. Are you going to divorce for something so trivial, he asked them. After that, they came to their senses. Yeron, the supposed person who has lived carelessly by giving the devil authority over him, decides to start a new life by putting things in order and living carefully. Will that person be fought by the devil? When these people turn around, God gives them strength, illumination, and divine consolation to get them started. But as soon as the struggles begin, the enemy will fight them fiercely. At that point, patience and perseverance is needed. Otherwise, how can the passions be uprooted? How can the old man shed his garment? How can pride go away? This is how we realize of what we can do, nothing on our own. And we humbly ask for God's mercy. It is then that humility comes. The same happens with someone who wants to give up his bad habit, for instance, smoking or drugs. At first, he feels happy with his decision and throws them away. Then he sees other people smoking, drinking, or whatever, and a fierce battle begins. If he overcomes the temptation, he turns back to the habit with difficulty. All of us need to resist a little. The devil does his job. Shouldn't we do ours? <clears throat> Yeronda, my thoughts tell me that now more than ever, the devil has great power. The devil has malice and hatred, but he does not have power. It is God's love that is all powerful. The devil tries to appear powerful, but he can't make it. He appears strong, but in reality, he is powerless. Many of his destructive schemes fail even before they start. Would a good father even ever allow a few child, uh, young hoodlums to bully his children? Yeronda, the dem demons scare me. What are you afraid of? The devil has no power. Christ is all-powerful. The tempter is rotten. Do you wear a cross? The devil's weapons are weak. Christ has harmed us with his cross. Only when we abandon our spiritual armor is the enemy strong. An Orthodox priest had only to show a small cross to a sorcerer and the demon, and he had invoked, and, and when the demon he had invoked started trembling. Why is the devil so afraid of the cross? Because when Christ received the spitting, the blows, and the beatings, the kingdom and the power of the devil was crushed. How wonderful is the way in which Christ defeated the devil. The devil's dominion was crushed with a reed, used to, say, uh, used to say a saint. When Christ was given the last blow with the reed, at that very moment, the devil's power was destroyed. In other words, patience is our spiritual defense and humility our greatest weapon against the devil. The greatest balm that Christ's sacrifice on the cross gave us is the crushing of the devil. After the crucifixion of Christ, the devil is like a snake with no fangs, with no poison. He is like a wild dog without teeth. All poison was removed from the devil. All teeth were removed from the wild dogs that are the demons. So they are now disarmed. While we are armed with the cross, there is nothing, really nothing that the demons can do to, uh, to a creature of God when we ourselves don't hand over the rights to them. They only make noise. They have no authority over people. Yeronda, what does the devil look like? Do you know how beautiful he is? He's something else. You have only to see him to believe it. But God's love does not allow the man to see the devil. For sure, most people would die of fear. Imagine if they could see how he operates if they could see his sweet form. 
Some among them, however, might really be entertained. I mean, entertained like the movies. But to get to see this kind of show, one must do a lot of work in advance. And even then, he may not make it. Does he have thorns in a tail? Yes, he is fully equipped. Yeronda, did the demons become so ugly when they fell from the angels? They became demons? Of course. It's like they have been struck by lightning. When lightning strikes a tree, it doesn't turn it into a charred stump. The demons look like that. For a while, I used to say to the devil, come by so I can see what you look like and avoid falling into your hands. Just a look is enough to see the, how evil you are. Should you, get, uh, should you get me? There's no telling how much I will suffer. Your own, does the devil know what we have in our heart? Know the human heart? That's the last thing he is fit to do. Only God has knowledge of our heart, and it is only to those who belong to him that he occasionally reveals, and that for our good, what is in our heart. The devil knows only the mischief, the evil that he plants in those who serve him. He does not know how good uh, our good thoughts. Sometimes he figures it out from experience, but even then, he usually misses the point. And if God does not permit him to do that, then he is constantly off target because he is in the dark. Visibility, zero. For instance, he has no way of knowing a good thought that crosses my mind. But if I have a bad thought, he is aware of it because he planted it there himself. If, say, I want to do something good to save someone, the devil does not know this. But when he puts a thought in my mind of someone and tells him, go, save that person, he will also plant pride in his heart. And that's why he knows this thought. The moment we accept pride, we provoke temptation. These things are very subtle. Do you remember the, ancient, or the incident of the Abba Makarios? Once Abba Makarios ran into the devil, who was coming back from a nearby desert where he had gone to tempt the monks. The devil said to him, all the brothers are very angry with me except one who is my friend and obeys me. And when he sees me, he spins like a wheel. And who is this brother, the Abba asked. The Ampothes, God send, is his name. The devil answered. Abba Macarius went to the desert and found the monk. He found a way to make him reveal his thoughts to him, and in this way the monk was helped. When Abba Macarius met the devil again, he asked him about this brother monk, and he said, Everyone is very angry with me, and the worst, even my friend has now changed. I cannot figure it out now. I can't figure out how, and he is angriest of all. The devil did not know that Abba Macarius had gone to the brother and helped him because the saint acted with humility out of love. And the devil, therefore, had no power over the particular thought. If Abba Macarius had taken pride in what he did, he would have dispelled the grace of God. The devil would have acquired rights over him. Were that the case, the devil would have known, because it would have been him who caused Abba's pride. <laughs> Gronda, why does God allow devil, the devil to tempt people so that he can select his children? Do whatever you want, God tells the devil, because no matter what he does, in the end, the devil will be smashed on the cornerstone that is Christ. If we believe that Christ is the cornerstone, then nothing will scare us. God does not give the devil the permission to test us unless something good is to come out of it. When he sees that a, great, a greater good will come out of it, he lets the devil do his job. Do you remember what Herod did? He killed 14,000 infants, but in so doing, he made 14,000 martyr angels. Can you believe it? 14,000 martyrs and angels. The devil had his face crushed. Diocletian became the devil's partner when he brutally persecuted Christians. But against his will, he did great good to the church Christ became, uh, because Christ enriched it with saints. He thought that he would eliminate all Christians, but in the end, he fell short of his expectations. He left countless holy relics for us to venerate and made the church Christ stronger. The good Lord created angels, but some of them fell because of pride and, and became demons. God created man, his perfect creation, to replace the fallen order of angels. 
This is why the devil is so jealous of men, God's creature. The demons are always complaining. We erred only once, and you are still punishing us. But they who err so many times, you always forgive them. Yes, but people repent, while they who were angels once and then became demons do not repent, and instead they become even more cunning and malicious and have set on destroying God's creatures with vengeance. Lucifer was the most luminous order of the angels, and in the end, because of their pride, they distanced themselves from God thousands of years ago and continue to do so, remaining unrepentant. If they would only say, Lord, have mercy on us, God would do something for them. If only they once cried, we have sinned, but they don't. If the devil were to cry out, I have sinned, he would become an angel again. God's love knows no bounds. But the devil has a strong will, obstinacy, egoism, and does not want to relent. He does not want to be saved. How horrible. And he used to be an angel. Yeronda, does the devil remember his previous state? Of course he does. He is infuriated because he doesn't want others to become angels and replace him. And he is getting worse. As time goes by, he is becoming more malicious and jealous. If only we could feel the state of misery of the devil, we would be weeping for him day and night. Even when you see a decent person become a criminal, you feel so sad. Imagine we, could, uh, we would feel if we were to see not what has happened to a man, but to an angel. Once a monk felt such pity for the demons that he knelt down and prayed as follows. You are God. If you want, you can find a way to save these wretched demons who, while they had known such great glory before, they know, now possess all the malice, uh, malice and devilishness of the world. And it had to, uh, not been for your protection, they would have destroyed us all. And while he was saying these words, praying with pain, he sees a dog's head appear next to him, sticking his tongue out and mocking him. It seems that God allowed that to happen in order to inform the monk that he is ready to accept the demons if they only repent, but they have no desire to be saved. <clears throat> Humility has great power and destroys the devil. It is the strongest shock that we can give the devil. Where there is humility, there is no place for him. And where there is no devil, there are, of course, no temptations. Once an ascetic pressed the devil to recite, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us. The devil said, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal. But he did not say, have mercy on us. The ascetic insisted, say it, say have mercy on us. But to no avail, had he complied, he would have become an angel again. And the devil will say anything except for have mercy on me, because this requires humility. To say have mercy on me requires humility indeed, and the soul receives the requested great mercy from God to our, our, God, our good Father. No matter what we do, we need humility, love, and nobility. Things are simple. It is we that make them difficult. To the extent possible, we must do what is difficult for the devil and easy for man. Love and humility are difficult for the devil and easy for man. Even a sickly man who cannot become an ascetic can defeat the devil with humility. In just one second, man can become either an angel or a devil. How? By choosing pride or choosing humility. Do you think it took hours for Lucifer to turn from an angel into a demon? Not at all. It took only him a few seconds. The easiest way for us to be saved is through love and humility. This is why we must start with love and humility and then go on to the rest. Pray that we might continuously give joy to Christ and to distress the devil, since the devil happens to like hell so much that he does not want to repent. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, through the prayers of thy venerable Father, by you, so have mercy on us and save us. Amen.